All right, well, thanks so much for joining us uh, this evening. I'm really excited about uh, the three panelists we have here. Um, you've got their bios in your program, so I will uh, avoid rehashing those to save them the embarrassment, but uh, they're all very uh, accomplished in their fields in uh, the theater, and what I'm so happy about is that they actually all represent, in some way, a very different yet complementary um, aspect of the theater industry. So uh, we have Carolyn Rossi Copeland, who's a producer. We have Whitney Britt, who does marketing and, and communication with the audience at, at large. And Elizabeth Davis, who, and I guess you guys have just met, I apologize, <laughs> uh, who is a, is a performer and a playwright. Um, so we have, we have a lot, we don't have all, but we have a lot of the pieces here. And the hope in this short conversation is really just to give you three things. Um, I'm hoping that through our conversation we can give you kind of a high level of how the industry works, how the various parts fit together. Number two, kind of a, a low level or kind of a day-to-day, -day. this is what it actually means to be doing these roles and working in this industry. And then thirdly, sort of a, any thoughts about the, for lack of a better word, the structure and direction of our industry. How is our industry fulfilling its role in God's created order? And which ways is it doing that? Which ways isn't it? Et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so I thought I would actually start with the first question, and that is, which is always a good question to start with, I guess, but that is, what do you do here exactly? And um, tell us uh, in, in a high level, and then give us some specificity maybe about what project you're working on right now, and I know there's some video clips. So let me start with Carolyn on that, though. Great, thank you for having me. Um, so I'm a theater producer, and I started the Lambs Theater uh, many years ago on 44th Street, which is now a very, very fancy hotel <laughs> and a great loss to all of us, two beautiful theaters. Um, and basically, a producer um, has to find or be given or be led to the project that they want to invest themselves in in a big way. It's like really raising a child from you know, infancy to adulthood. And in order to do that, after you find the project and you have the beginnings of the creative team together, you have to go out and raise the money. And in a nonprofit world, you have a development department, so you have a staff that's helping you raise money from grants and foundations. But in the, and, and I've transitioned into the commercial world. And in the commercial world, that you raise that money through investors. And they're called angels. And they are indeed angels because they allow you to go about the work of producing the play. Uh, producing a play, uh, you basically are involved in everything from the smallest decision to the largest decision, but you are responsible for holding the collaborative team together and, ins and insinuating yourselves in the middle of it when you feel the need to, but allowing everybody to do their job. The director is the director, the casting director is the casting director, the designers design, the marketing team markets, and the producer's job is to keep the environment one that is healthy and one that where everyone can really be fruitful and do their best work. Um, I'm working on a piece right now which is the largest piece I've ever worked on. It's called Amazing Grace. It's been in development for the last five years. Uh, it's we've had to raise $12.5 million without any corporate you know, um, money behind us, so it's literally been individually uh, raised. And we did a production at good speed, and we are opening in Chicago at the Bank of America Theater, where I was this Tuesday afternoon, actually showing this clip of Amazing Grace to our marketing team. So you're going to see a very, very short clip of Josh Young, who plays John Newton. This is not the Wilbur Wilberforce story of the movie. This is the story of John Newton and his life. And um, it's, it's an amazing story. So we can see that clip. Great. Come to Chicago. Tell your friends in Chicago. <laughs> yeah, it's actually a great transition into, yeah. we just saw a, a sort of a marketing piece, and so. I feel like we're going from the sublime to the ridiculous, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm Whitney Britt. I'm the marketing manager at Stage Entertainment USA. Stage Entertainment is the largest commercial theater producer in continental Europe. So if, forgive me, I'm going to do a little bit of explaining. So most Broadway producers are not a corporate producer. There's only a few around. There's Disney, there's Stage, there's Broadway Across America. 
So my job and what I do, it doesn't exist in most offices. There's not normally a marketing team in your, in your Broadway producing house. It's normally done somewhere else. It's done at your agency. It's done down the street. So my day is crazy and insane and can be me buying boxing shorts at Paragon Sports to controlling Twitter to working on a TV spot to talking to my record label. It is crazy and everything and in between. If it possibly is marketing or press related, somehow my hand is in it. Um, so I'm working on the show. I don't know if you've heard it. It's called Rocky. <laughs> we opened last Thursday. <laughs> I have a new TV commercial, which I'll show you in just a second. Um, so the cool thing about my job is really working with an audience and crafting a message because for the longest time for me, I didn't know that there were jobs in the theater besides being an actor. Somehow I just missed it. No one told me that for the longest mm -hmm. time. And there's so many theater people that are your entertainment lawyer, that are your producer, that are your marketing manager, that are your publicist. There's so many jobs to be close to theater and be close to the work and be close to the art without being an actor. If you don't have the skin and you don't have that thing that actors have to have. Um, so I love my crazy job, but I get to work with crafting my artistic message to the audience. Um, so we opened Thursday. I can't even possibly explain what the team does when you open a Broadway show. It's super not glamorous. I just need to be very clear. Um, we go up in this tiny little room upstairs at the party, and there's a screen, and there's spreadsheets, and no one's wearing their shoes. And we start pulling all the reviews from all the papers, and we start writing down a positive column, a positive mixed column, a positive negative column, a negative column, which I don't like that column. Um, and then I spend the next 24 hours changing my TV, changing my online ads, changing everything to tell the world that we are a hit. And hey, we are, so please come see my show. Um, but I want to show you my TV commercial and know that I'm trying to reach the most people possible and to come see what I truly believe is a great piece of art and also a great piece of an everyman story. So, hit it, Amy Lee. I, I was there at your opening, and it was indeed an incredible experience, so congratulations. Yeah. yeah. See, I don't even get to see anybody. <laughs> <laughs> So now, finally, Elizabeth, we almost sort of maybe kind of can think about we know that what you do, but maybe you'll tell us that we're wrong about what they're wrong. You know, I, I can't do what I do without the, the incredible number of people a, a, around the industry that are doing what they're, they're doing. I mean, it's, it's a collaborative team. And if, if we're not being a team and we don't have an audience, I can't do what I do. You know, then I'm just talking to a wall, pretending that I'm engaging in in the theater, which I'm not. I'm just talking to a wall, or perhaps in a room by myself. Um, a padded room at that a point. Yeah, perhaps. Um, my name is Elizabeth, and I'm an actor. Um, I, I play an instrument, and I enjoy writing. Um, so I prefer, perhaps this is silly, but I prefer the title artist. I think a lot of actors in the city um, prefer that. Um, so uh, I <clears throat> got my undergraduate degree in um, theater performance. I got my graduate degree in, in theater performance and I've been in the city uh, in any number of things, whether it's doing crazy insane day jobs, whether it's working two day jobs and then doing a show, whether it's um, being out of town doing regional theater, whether it's um, doing some TV work, whether it's um, Doing Broadway, um, it, as an actor, you have to be incredibly flexible. <laughs> I think flexibility and malleability are essential for the artist's soul. Um, my day is any number of things. I think um, I think consistency eludes me uh, on on a daily basis, um, and I think that's one of the hardest parts about being an actor is saying I never really know if I'm going to if my agent's going to call me at you know, 5.30 and say, okay, you have, a, you have an 11 o'clock audition, and then that 11 o'clock audition means I have to call and say, this rehearsal we were going to do, we need to bump that back. So there's, there's so many moving parts to being an artist. And I was talking with Melanie about, um, as an artist, you are also, you are also your marketer, your, your business manager. You are, um, 
you know, your, your t t Twitter manager, you know, you're all these things. Um, and if, if you don't do all of those things well, sometimes your art does not surface. You're not able to get your art seen or have it flourish um, if you're not able to handle the business aspects of, of art. So I, I think being an artist um, or being an actor is also being a good business manager. Um, so th those are my thoughts. So that it's I hadn't thought about that until that. But you really no. you see you see the entire industry because you are acting one moment as an executive, you know, yeah. managing your own career, and then the next moment you're you know playing that purely artistic role. And there's never a purely artistic role, I right. guess. It's always a mix. But I think that's why people hire publicists because they're like, I'm tired of being my own promoter, my own business manager, I have to have help with this this side of, of things that, um, so yeah, but. And we're gonna hear, uh, we're gonna hear a bit of Joe, as Emily said later, so, and, and Carolyn's gonna introduce that, so I'm excited about to hear more about that. So, uh, we have 10 minutes, is that right? Okay, great. So, um, one question, and, and feel free, wh whoever would like to answer or not answer this, but one question we batted around on email is, um, just trying to give people a little sense of closer up what it looks like to be in your shoes as a professional. What's an example of like a great success? What's an example specifically of a great failure you may have had? Feel free to pass. <laughs> but I know some, I know, some, I know, yeah, there was at least. think about it and I was thinking about it and I kept going through the roster of the shows that I've produced in my life and I was like well no not really that no not really that no not really that and I realized that what success for me has been um, really following the call on my life because some of the shows have been great and some of them have not been so great and some investors have made money and some haven't but the call in my life was also to, to be faithful, to be a wife and a mother and a producer. And I wanted to be a theater producer that did works that were commercially viable, uh, that really addressed the Judeo-Christian <coughs> message and truths. But it's really in the balance of all of that that I think I feel successful. Not one show, not one part of my life, but it's the integration of being the whole person that you're called to be that I feel is the greatest success of, of my life. Yeah. No, it's true because, yeah. Shows, they come, Yeah, yeah. I can say lots of silly things that are successes and failures, but um, I worked on Big Fish this fall. I hope, uh, I know. Um, so I hope somebody got to see the 98 performances we did. Um, um, you know, I, as much, look, I'm a marketer. I have a business job in the theater, but at the end of the day, you work with amazing people. And if I can't get someone to buy a ticket, that means my actors are out of a job. Yeah. That means my stagehands are out of a job. That means every single person I see every day doesn't have a job. So I feel a huge burden to do the very best at my job because at the end of the day, there's only X many Broadway theaters and eight performances a week and so many tickets. And the only thing can change is my TV commercial. My, what, the stuff that I do is the stuff that I can try to fix and tweak and change and and try to get you know Joe Schmo from Long Island who comes to see theater once a year to say pick my show over Phantom of the Opera. Yeah. I mean that oh, that is so Big Fish was a wonderful show that moved people in a way that only theater does. And having grown men cry in the audience, it, it it's those moments where you realize theater is that thing that the one medium that there's no there's no in between. If you're affected by that human being four feet away from you, then you, you can't stop your emotions. You, you will be affected by that. Um, so to work with such a beautiful company that had a show that had so, such a wonderful mm. takeaway was a great success, yeah. but it was a colossal business failure. Yeah. And I, for me, I feel like I failed 
all those people by not being able to sell mm -hmm. those tickets to get to the show. But mm -hmm. that's that's his business. Mm -hmm. So yeah. kind of sucks. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess. Uh, Failure first, I'll speak to failure first. I, uh, I learned in grad school that um, my slogan was, failure is my best friend. Um, that failing forward is, it's just the most essential thing as we grow in this business, I think in life. Um, <laughs> so it's that trick of saying, wow, I failed. This is good. <laughs> you know, how is this gonna, how is this going to propel me? How do I, bounce back and recover, recover more quickly each time from my failures to learn and grow for the next time. Um, but s I think some of the standouts, I mean, I was dropped by my first agent in the city. I, I'll never forget like where I was standing in my apartment, like the phone, like where everything was and thinking like, I think I said to myself, okay, okay, here, like, here we go. Um, so that happened, and then I remember I was doing the show once down downtown at New York Theater Workshop off Broadway, and those <laughs> those agents walked on stage because you could walk on stage in this show, <laughs> and uh, and I thought that it was going to be this triumphant moment of like, what do you think of me now, you know? And instead, I became I was so emotionally rent. I just I got this terrible migraine like on the spot. And it's still, it's still like a gut, like, you know, those visceral moments of like, that was painful. That really hurt. Um, and with regards to, anyway, that's, it's, it's fine now. Um, but with, with regards to six things. The Tony nomination probably helped. Like, <laughs> it's, all right, it's in the bio, but I just want to start. Well, with, with regards to that, you know, I think about that, that moment and, and those things. Um, but. The successes that really stand out to me with regards to the once experience were the parents that would come up um, and say, you know, my child is, is playing the violin now because they saw you. Or um, I, I had a woman that saw me in a show in Cleveland and she had brought her daughter and she said, my daughter is now um, studying theater at NYU because of seeing a show that you did in Cleveland. So those personal moments of feeling like I've, um, the, the small step-by-step -step work you do, that you don't, you don't think anyone's watching. Like, that's the work that actually are the seeds that are planted that you get to look behind you at one point and say, oh, there's a sunflower that just grew because of that little seed that I had no idea was planted. So I think we're each doing that every day. We just have to be intentional about maybe covering over with dirt and watering those seeds that we don't know if we're going to grow or not, but we gotta, we got to plant them. Okay, I think I have time. Yes, okay, I'm gonna ask this question. Great, we have a few more minutes. Um, so where are we, and I don't mean to get too meta on this, but does anybody, where are we in our industry? I mean, there's always talk about this is the best of times and the worst of times in the theater. I think that that refrain is always going in one, one way or another. But does anybody have any thoughts on this, specifically from sort of a theological point of view? Like, how are we doing as an industry in fulfilling, like, the purpose that God has for this specter? I, I, I just, I, I went back through, and I don't know if this is speaking exactly what you're saying, but I remember someone talking about <clears throat> that last season specifically on Broadway had a lot of faith-based shows and uh, that, that the conversation was n not scary anymore. Like pe yeah. people were saying, let's talk about this a little more. And I went back and there was Craig Wright had a show called Grace on Broadway last season, which it's an, I mean, it is what it is. Um, there was Hands on a Hard Body, which I, it's not, Sounds not like what it is, but there was a lot of there was a lot of that's why it, it closed unfortunately because of, but there was a lot of faith based scenes in that there was scandalous Kathy Lee Gifford scandalous but there I mean Kathy Lee is yeah. uh, she's a I think she's a believer is she not and the, and there was a lot of faith based things in that there was Leap of Faith which is the remake of the movie but that was incredibly faith based and then there was Testament of Mary which you know theologically was off but um, <laughs> there there was still the um, yeah. We, we were, it was, yeah, we were corporately as, I think, as an industry discussing more. Yeah. Um, so just from that slice, I was encouraged last year at least. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 
I agree with that because I'm thinking back, you know, 1978, 79, when the theaters were empty and the one ch theater was sold for the church that is now in the Times Square Church. There was, there was so little product. Uh, now there is so much product. And now I think, in, in part because of movies like The Passion of the Christ, mm -hmm. You know, people realize if you can hit a demographic, they're going to buy a ticket. It's a different demographic. But I think the conversation didn't exist in 1978, 79, 80. It just was void. And the, I know I produced a little show called Freud's Last Session. And the That's conversation fun. was between C.S. Lewis and Sigmund Freud. And I really thought it would run three months. I booked a theater on the west side that no one had heard of because the lambs didn't exist anymore. And after three months, it was four months. But I was amazed that people wanted to hear this conversation. And it ended up running for a long time. It runs all over the country now because people want to be engaged in the eternal questions whether it's through song and dance or a play, they really do want to think. The baby boomers are getting older. People are starting to think about the end of their lives. And it's become more fashionable to talk about it. And Nothing near is profound. But um, what Dan was saying earlier about how theater has uh, people from investors who have so much money, it's not even fathomable to your house staff, There, there's a weird micro organization that exists in a theater from from your door guy to mm -hmm. everyone in the building mm -hmm. and it's, uh, going back to Sandy watching oh. having this little your own community of people be able to gather together I, I don't know how many other industries have that top to bottom mm -hmm. team that can pull together like a family and that is a really yeah. lovely end at church-centric way to uh, to be a part of a community. It really is, I mean, it is kind of secular church in many respects. Like, where we were talking about this with Gotham Fellowship earlier this week. It's like, where else today do you have people sit in a dark room without information and think about the big questions or just about, anyway. So it's, and, and the community element is totally mirrors the, the church. It's such an element of common grace. But anyway, all that to say, we're out of time. Um, thank you so much for talking with us. And, uh